All right. Okay, so first of all, uh, good evening to everyone who is watching us. Uh, thank you, Professor Michael Bernardo, for coming here and uh, sharing your knowledge in this uh, topic that's very interesting. And I would like to first introduce uh, Professor Michael Bernardo. He's a senior director at the Citizen Bank Wealth Management. He has a doctorate in finance uh, from the Capella University, master's in accounting by the University of Phoenix, a uh, bachelor's from uh, Rutgers University, and he's licensed with the uh, FINRA Series 7 and 24. And Professor Michael, welcome. Uh, it's you. a pleasure. It's good and, to be here. Uh, you're welcome. And uh, the stage is yours. If you feel free to uh, share your slides and just begin your presentation. And at the end, we're going to bring give, uh, some questions that the audience might have to you. Okay. Thank you. All right, just give me one second here. I'll share the screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you see it? Able to see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. So tonight, one of the things we're going to be talking about, uh, the importance of financial planning. First of all, thank you all for joining. I know it's, uh, you know, it's dinner time in some places, a little later in others. And it's nice of you to, to take the time to come and listen to hear what we have to say about this. Um, so look, financial planning is, is a very key activity in the financial services industry. And to start off with, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. You know, I, we went over what my educational um, criteria are, but I have 25 years in financial services, uh, predominantly in broker dealers and investment advisors. However, I did spend about 10 years, a little less than 10 years in consulting at a large uh, big four consulting firm where I literally helped broker dealers and investment advisors improve processes, actually started about a half dozen or so broker dealers, helped them build their controls, et cetera. Um, I did spend about five minutes as a financial advisor and I have to commend all of you out there that do that for a living because I have to tell you, I just, I wasn't good at it, which is how I ended up in risk and compliance and supervision um, and doing tasks such as that. So, you know, very commendable for what you do. It's, it's not an easy job. Um, and our goal here is to help you, even if you could pick up one or two tidbits from this or maybe reinforce some things, you know, it would be really helpful. So when we think about financial planning, obviously we think about the end game, which is product selection. And for those of you that have been around for a long time, like I have, you know, Selecting a product for a client just based on meeting with them or picking a stock, stock of the day, stock of the week, um, or some mutual fund that uh, your firm is, is you know, giving you information on or some wholesalers. It's just not the way we're doing things today. Um, it's, you know, it's really changed between what the clients are expecting, the regulatory regime, what they're expecting and requiring us to do. It's really changed the name of the game for how we do business. So understanding things like the client's financial profile and objectives and risk tolerance, it's not just filling out a line or two on a new account form. We're really now required to understand that, understand the entire client. Um, and really the best way to do this is to do some type of financial plan. It doesn't have to be extensive 40 page document, but also, you know, like I said, one or two lines on a new account form just quite doesn't quite cut it. So what we're going to do here is I uh, just gave you a little bit of an introduction. We're going to talk about what is a financial plan, who does it, um, are they necessary, what are the limitations. We'll talk about how that really works with the advisor-client relationship. I'll go over a couple of tools. There's really a lot of tools out there. The two that I'll mention, you probably know them well. You may even be using them currently. And then I thought what would be a little more fun, you know, if uh, financial services and finance can be fun, is to go over some scenarios as to things that, based on what we're talking about, some good scenarios, some not so good scenarios, and then how does that feed into the compliance and regulatory considerations? And then we'll finish up with, uh, with some Q&A. So when we think about a financial plan, and if you went out and Googled this, you could probably find you know, the eight parts of a financial plan, the five parts of a financial plan, but really there's, you know, 
we'll call it somewhere between eight and a dozen uh, different aspects of the plan that we really need to think about when we're trying to determine what is it that a client wants or needs. So you can see on the list here, short and long-term goals. Now, a lot of times you'll see folks focus on only short-term goals. They wanna make that trade for the client. They wanna make a few bucks and get out of the position and move on to something else. And then there's even long-term goals, which are also important, but long-term goals aren't only the thing that we should be focused on. You know, we do have short and intermediate term goals. Someone's going to college in five years, we need to finish planning for that. Um, I'm gonna be buying a new house next year. You know, what should I do or not do in relation to that? So very important to figure on those goals. And those goals really are from the client. So that should be a narrative that comes from the client that really helps you determine what your investment suggestions are gonna be for them. Uh, current net worth. There's always lots of confusion around net worth. Do I include the house? Do I not include the house? What about the second house? Um, how do I figure out the debt and how does the debt impact the net worth? What about my son's or my daughter's uh, college loans that I'm currently paying for? So again, the tools that are out there really help work through that. And we don't wanna make recommendations to a client without really understanding what their true net worth is. You have some folks out there, lots of assets, you know, maybe those lots of assets are gonna lead you to or would lead you to a certain recommendation. Um, but when you get through it and you realize they are leveraged to the hilt and certain recommendations just are not gonna make sense for them. Cash flow. Cash flow is a big one. Um, you know, you have you have two sides of the coin there. You have some folks that literally have lots and lots of money in the bank, they've got a large portfolio. They have a lot of investments, but their cash flow is literally a trickle. Maybe they're semi-retired or retired. Um, they're in between jobs, especially with the way things are the last few years and even going back into the early 2000s. Uh, so their cash flow is not what it should be. You've also got the flip side. You have folks with a very strong cash flow, you know, have a really good salary. They get quarterly or annual bonuses, um, et cetera, but they have nothing saved. Those are two very different scenarios that we have to look at when we're determining what recommendations to make. And again, that's where the financial plan comes into play. Along with that is some folks do budgets on their own, some don't, but it's something that within the plan that you can really work through with the client regarding their budget. One of the things you probably hear if you know your compliance officer or your um, you know, risk partner or, you know, senior management, they'll tell you clients should have six months in reserves, 12 months in reserves, depending on where you work, um, that number could vary. But, you know, what's that emergency budget look like? Things like that have to be included. All right. So this one, this next one, tax planning. I know tax is a four letter word. Um, so we don't give tax advice in most circumstances. Of course, there are some advisory firms that do have tax departments that do do that type of planning. But we do need to help the client work through their own tax plan, the tax planning they do with their tax advisor um, without overstepping our bounds, particularly if we're FINRA registered, where you know financial advisors we and registered investment advisors only, we just really need to be careful, um, but we also can't ignore it. Emergency funding, which I mentioned with part of the budget, um, Investment objectives. This is a tough one, and it gets really difficult when we talk about the, the client's sophistication. Some clients say, that's easy, I want to make money. Other clients say, I'm looking for some short-term gains with, uh, you know, with some long-term just stability. I don't want to see large durations from the market. I don't want to really experience any of that. Some say I'm willing to risk X percent of my portfolio on those gyrations with the hopeful return that's greater than the average. So, you know, really important to understand those investment objectives. Do they want income? Are they looking for an income stream, particularly if their current cash flow is really slow? Um, are they looking for growth? And again, risk tolerance works in with that. You know, what is it that they're willing to accept from a risk perspective? So insurance and risk management and in the industry, out of the industry, we call it both. Um, insurance doesn't simply mean life insurance. Some folks in the business think of insurance simply as annuities, um, but really there is a, there's a risk management perspective to this. Are you 20 and single 
uh, which God bless if you're you know doing that and you're investing already. Um, are you 60 and your kids are older and have their own kids and you're getting close to retirement? Well, maybe your insurance needs are much lower uh, than when you were 40 and had a growing family and a large mortgage and things like that. So again, all things that should be considered. Retirement, never too early to start thinking about it. For those of you that are like me, you know, getting close to some type of retirement age, whatever that age is, um, we all wish we would have started younger. Um, I, I have some students in some classes that I teach who are literally in their early 20s and are already talking about it or have saved money. That's commendable. And that's the type of thing we should be thinking about with our clients, regardless of how far away or how close they are to retirement. And then estate planning. And estate planning is definitely more on the advanced side, larger client portfolios, et cetera. Um, and some of the, some of the uh, tools that you can use will or may not go into estate planning. Um, but depending on the client, it would be worthwhile to have that conversation. You know, through a little joke in here in Monte Carlo, it's not just an old Chevy. Um, you know, the, the scenario planning we do for clients, what happens if the market moves a certain way? What happens if we move into a bear market? You know, for the client who uh, maybe is three years from retirement, um, is willing to take some risk, but we're in a situation like we are today, we may not be looking at a, a very high percentage of equities in their portfolio because when we model it out, it may look like, well, you're actually going to you know, miss your objective uh, for growth by X percent, which is really going to impact your retirement savings. And then again, financial planning, it is the cornerstone of what we do. We need to really do it. Um, I will tell you at the firm where I work, it's been a, a very big push to really lead with planning. That's the way that we you know, maintain our client base and really do what's best for the client. Uh, I thought I'd just run through this real quick. Um, the different type of financial planning professionals. So you know, the creme de la creme, we've got certified financial planners. Um, they are globally recognized. They are able to do tax and they're governed by the CFP board. Chartered financial analysts, really more of a corporate function, um, but you may have folks, especially if you're in a large institution, uh, if they're managing portfolios that you're selling to your clients, they may be some of the folks that are managing those portfolios. And then personal financial specialists. And that's more of folks who are really on the path to one of the others and do include some tax planning. And a lot of them do have the CPA exam and it's governed by the AICPA. Uh, obviously, we've got registered reps. I'm sure you know most of you on this call are a registered rep, series six or seven, um, as well as a lot of you are you know financial advisor. Or I'm sorry, are registered investment advisors, series sixty five with the SEC. And you know this is a, a newer newer type of um, function in some firms where we have a centralized planning function. So allowing the financial advisor to meet with the client to work through the client's needs, but then to have a separate person from some other team come in and really work through the financial plan with them. So again, a little bit newer in some firms, uh, there are a few smaller firms that have been doing that for a while, but it's, it's really starting to take hold and it helps to really press on the need for the financial plan and allows the advisors to advise and be uh, a trusted advisor to that client without having to go through the nuts and bolts of entering the data and doing things like that. So they sit on the same side of the table as the client. So financial plan, is it necessary? Some may argue it's not. Uh, it depends on the type of business that you're doing, but look, it's 2022. Um, we've got best interest requirements. You know, Gone are the days of, is it suitable? Is it good for the client? Now it's, is it in the client's best interest? And for anybody who was only a registered investment advisor before understands that for folks that were really more of stock pickers and uh, selling mutual funds and insurance products, best interest is much newer for you. And understanding that need really comes back to the need for a financial plan because just because something is suitable for a client doesn't necessarily mean it's in their best interest. So you can see on the second bullet, best interest does require a comprehensive view of the customer. So we need to look at everything that we mentioned on that first page, including their history, including their understanding of the overall market. Um, have they been trading for a long time? Have they been investing for a long time? 
Do they understand even what their 401k is and things like that? The other thing with financial planning, it helps remove some bias. Not all of it, but it does help remove it. It allows you to refer to this, you know, this, this programmatic method of saying the client needs X percentage in fixed income, should have X percentage in equities, should be doing some leverage, perhaps some lending. Um, they should be looking at certain insurance or risk management products. So it does help remove that rather than you just doing the, you know, the wet thumb in the air, looking to see which way the wind blows. So what's the bottom line? Financial planning is necessary. It is. Again, there are some, uh, some scenarios that you'll see, and we talk about it later on in the scenarios, where financial planning isn't always used and may not be necessary, um, but it could become a very slippery slope if we're not doing it. So I get this question sometimes when we talk through financial planning and it's, what is it, you know, what is it about financial plans? Does it do everything I need to do? Well, no, it doesn't. Um, when you think about the risks associated with making a recommendation, right? So your personal risk as an advisor, your firm's risk as a brokerage or investment advisor firm, um, it, doing a financial plan does not create a riskless scenario. Uh, you know, it helps, it helps mitigate that risk. It helps remove the bias. Um, it allows you to point to that programmatic solution, but it does not necessarily make it seamless. It also generally doesn't give you specific investments. So you're gonna get some general buckets of things you should be investing in or making recommendations to the client, but that doesn't mean it's gonna give you the specific you know, these five stocks, these two mutual funds, uh, perhaps some, some, uh, some uh, municipal bonds, uh, some high rate bonds, et cetera. Uh, so it's really not necessarily gonna do that. And, you know, it's not, it's not a robo solution. Um, it's also not gonna guarantee your return. So if your financial plan yields a certain percentage of assets in each bucket, and generally those assets return, or we expect them to return a certain percentage year over year, it's not gonna guarantee that. And of course, I know that, you know that, your clients don't necessarily know that. Particularly as we get more programmatic, their expectations may be, well, you told me to do a financial plan, I did one, and now you're telling me that that plan, which said I should expect 7.5% return year over year, I'm only yielding 5% return. So again, doesn't guarantee that. Um, the other thing is it, it may not actually match up with what the client's thinking. Some of it is that the client changes their mind over time, which really lends itself to the other point of financial plans are living documents and need to be updated. They're not just a one and done. Uh, I have seen lots of folks do that. They do the plan, they make the investments, they stick the plan in a drawer. Those investments may change over time just based on uh, one-off conversations with the client or some reviews or some satisfaction or dissatisfaction with certain investments, um, but then they're never looked at again. They're never updated. So that really does need to happen. The other piece is there may be a disconnect between what the client is trying to explain to you and what you're actually hearing or understanding. Through no fault of your own, it could simply be the client doesn't have a deep knowledge of what it is, uh, you know, what the investing world entails. They may not be able to verbalize what it is they really want. Um, or like I said, they may just be changing their mind over time or uh, not even remembering what it is they told you originally. So financial planning will take you to the goal line, but it's really up to you to make that jump over the line and, uh, and score. You know, we talked about the, the benefits of financial planning for the client. We talked about some of the reasons to do it. But some of you might be saying, what's in it for me? And look, we're in this business as a business. Um, it's not, you know, it's not, we're not doing it for our own health. Uh, well, I guess in some ways we are, right, to make money uh, so we can stay healthy. But when you think about what financial planning does, it's not simply doing the best for the client, it's also going to help you. How does it help you? If you look at some of the statistics and, you know, statistics are all over the map, of course, just depends where you look. 
but let's call this somewhat of an average. Asset gathering is one. Um, if you don't do a plan and you don't have a strong enough voice in discussions with your client, there's a good chance you're going to yield about a 10% wallet share for that client. And just because you yielded 10% versus 50 or 80 or 100 doesn't mean you worked any less hard. You may have worked just as hard or maybe even harder and still yielded 10% wallet share. So based on some of the statistics out there, doing a financial plan tends to yield closer to about 70% of wallet share on average for clients versus 10% for not doing financial planning. Again, that's an average. There's lots of you out there that have probably gathered assets without a plan and you've gathered all 100%, multiple millions, uh, maybe even more, And but that's on average. The other thing about planning, when you do more than just make a simple recommendation, when you do planning, when you go in depth with a client on their history, their you know, their planning, what does their family look like? What's the family dynamic? What do they want to do with the money over long term? What are their true retirement plans? Are they, do they want to start a business or, uh, you know, that's some kind of retirement, right? Starting a business. But do they want to start that business? Do they want to uh, create some type of, of uh, function that helps others by using some of that money? All these things really make you a trusted advisor. When you get more in depth with the client, more beyond just recommending one or two products that the client holds, and maybe you never speak to them again or don't speak to them uh, until you're pitching them to come with you to your new firm, then becoming that trusted advisor will really help you cement that relationship. With that, client retention. Uh, I don't have a statistic on this, but I do know where I work, client retention rates, and actually a few of the places I've worked, uh, client retention rates are much, much higher when it involves doing a plan versus doing a single or even two product uh, sales pitch. So again, selling those one or two products, doing a variable annuity and a mutual fund, less chance retaining that client versus doing an overall plan. By the way, even if that plan doesn't get fully executed by you, not that you want that to happen, but there are instances where you may recommend and have the client move assets over to do a portion of that plan. And then that client does something on their own. They have an account at an E-Trade or a place like that where uh, they're doing you know, self-directed and they use that plan to help part of it. Not necessarily the best from your perspective, but still you've now created a situation where that client stays with you. Wealth transfer. So we see this all the time. We have clients with oodles of cash, lots of investments. They pass away and their kids take those assets and move them someplace else. Really difficult when you think about all the time you spent with that client, helping them, helping them grow their wealth, only to see it walk out the door. Well, how do you, how do you at least have a fighting chance? Continue to do that planning with the client. Let that planning include their adult children. Um, or others that they plan on leaving the money to. Don't just leave, take it for granted that when they pass, those assets are gonna stay with you because in many instances, they won't. So very important to have those children or others, other beneficiaries, um, think of them as potential clients every time you meet with them. So again, what happens if you don't use the financial plan, smaller share of wallet I talked about. So potential liability. I kind of chuckled when I wrote this, the one trade chump, you know, that's the client you call up and, you know, maybe I'm dating myself a little bit when I would talk to a client back way back in the day, you're talking, you know, early mid nineties and would say, have I got a stock idea for you? And you would do the one trade, the client would make some money or maybe not. Um, and you, you never really did anything with that client again, or maybe you did another trade two years later. So there's, there's some liability there. You know, there's a need to really understand what the client needs what they want and how that activity that you're recommending is gonna impact their overall financial situation. And again, clients can easily leave. Not that this is, um, not this is a, a hostage negotiation, but the more you do for the client, the more they get close to you, the more you become a trusted advisor, the more difficult it is for them to leave. Not that you wouldn't want them to leave if they didn't wanna be with you anymore, but if you make it 
more challenging if you make it that you are providing them with the most services, most number of services that they can get, and you're providing good service, they're not gonna to wanna to leave. If, if there's only one thing they're dissatisfied with, they're gonna overlook that one thing in order to stay with you for the other five things you're giving them. If you're only doing that one thing for them, you're gonna lose that client. So if you're not providing the advice, your clients will go somewhere else to get it. That's the bottom line for that. This is really basic. Um, you know, InvestNet has Money Guide Pro. Fidelity uses eMoney or has eMoney. There's a lot out there. They all not only offer, or not only there are others, but within each one of them, there's various versions. Um, I know the firm where I worked, we had a few different uh, business lines within the Wealth Management Group, and the the lower end business line that handled the affluent, mass affluent, and mass market used a different, much different version of Money Guide than the high net worth and ultra high net worth. Um, you may even see within your firm, as you move up from say high net worth to ultra high net worth, they may move to something else like an e-money or something. It, you know what, it's, it's really about what you do with it. They're all great products out there, or for the most part. Um, some firms do create their own branded version. Either they try and you know mimic things like Money Guide Pro or e-money, um, or they buy a tool and just brand it as their own through agreements with the companies. Um, but really, it's not so much the tool itself, but rather how you use it, provided it's at least a, you know, a reputable company with a reasonable tool. So here's a real good consideration. The types of products offered at your firm. Um, I've seen, so in my consulting days, you know, I went to a lot of different, uh, a lot of different broker dealers, a lot of different financial services firms. And there's definitely some challenges to what your clients are able to get from you. Let's assume for the moment you can offer every type of product, whether it's stocks, bonds, mutual funds, insurance, et cetera. That's great, but maybe you don't offer everything. Maybe your shelf is not as open as other firms. Uh, I worked with one firm that only sold proprietary products and both insurance, mutual funds, they did not make stock or, or bond recommendations. So it was just insurance mutual funds. Um, they were full service where the client could self-direct those other investments. But when doing a financial plan, it becomes very challenging to create a best interest scenario when your best interest is to offer the funds or insurance products that you sell, that only you create and sell. So that's definitely a consideration as to the approach um, and could impact your wallet share, right? Because the last thing you wanna do is to um, get tangled with regulators and complaints over the fact that you have all proprietary products in your client's portfolio um, and they aren't necessarily in the best interest of that client. And I thought it was important to restate if you're not providing that advice, your clients will go somewhere else to get it. So went through that, uh, that was, probably about a good 30 minutes or so, I thought it'd be good to go through a few scenarios. <clears throat> and these aren't meant to be funny, but in some respects, they might be a little funny for some of you. Uh, and for any of you who have gone through some extensive training, either as a financial advisor or something else, financial services, you've probably done something similar to this. But the actual scenarios do help drive home the points regarding many topics, one of which being we're talking about tonight, planning. So John, who is a broker at Dewey, Cheatham & Howe, yeah, that's been used over and over again. Um, John's a stock picker. Um, he's kind of what I talked about earlier. You know, he's the guy that looks for the stock of the day. He, he tries to get IPOs, which, you know, definitely difficult now, not, not a big IPO market per se. Uh, looks for those secondary offerings, looks to find out what stocks may be moving in the near future, makes those recommendations to clients. And, you know, generally... He does okay, um, but those clients that he has are all they have with him primarily is individual equities. He's got a good client age range. He has them, you know, from right after college or just as they start working, all the way up until retirement, post retirement. So really good range, good mixture of clients. And he's been doing this for about ten years, eleven years. You know, real. Not that it's easy, but it's easier to do this type of um, to do this type of business in the market we've had. For any of you that have been around since the 90s, 
you know, we've seen the ups and downs. If you got in at the start of the internet craze, you saw what happened when that really went south. Um, so, you know, there's definitely some, some challenges to having only been working in an up market. Some things about John that are concerning, his turnover ratio is more than 300%. So he's got a book of say $50 million and every year he's turning that book over three times. So about 150 million, uh, you know, in, in sales and uh, purchases and sales. His average return is 12%, which is very good, um, but his average commission ratio is 8%. So while his clients are earning 12%, he's earning 8% and he does not go out and get a lot of new clients. He's not getting the referrals because he's just seen as a stock picker and a lot of his clients, friends and other folks are just not that interested. So he's not growing his business the way he could be. Uh, what he's basically doing is churning and burning right now. And while he may not be any serious trouble, there's going to be some point when the market turns on him, in which case the clients are going to turn on him as well. Um, he averages about 15% share a wallet. And I've seen plenty of people just like John in my days in compliance. You know, that 15% share a wallet, always turning over that book, always looking for the next thing to buy and sell, spending his days pounding the phones, trying to get new clients, staring at the stock screen you know, worried about a, a position that's moving a half a dollar or more. Um, and he's done absolutely no financial planning for his clients. The reason he hasn't is because he really has no interest in pulling in the rest of their assets. It's, uh, and again, these do come from real scenarios that I've worked on both in regulation and in compliance at different firms. And John doesn't want to do it because it's too hard. He considers that work too difficult. He would rather trade stocks He'd rather get those clients to, you know, earn a couple 10, 12% per year, have them love him for his brilliance, not quite understanding that had they left their stock, uh, their positions stagnant for even a year or two years, they may have earned 15, 16, 17% on average per year. So, so that's John. Susan, who's a financial advisor, bank securities, bank affiliated broker dealer. She does a lot of insurance. Uh, for any of you either work at or know people who work at bank affiliated broker dealers, you know that they're hot houses for, um, for selling a lot of insurance. They do a lot of fixed and variable annuities. Um, that's changing in the marketplace now, particularly when you've seen some of the, the mergers um, and, and these banks that are merging and growing their wealth management businesses. But there are still some diehard bank affiliated brokers who really predominantly do insurance um, they know insurance. It's what they understand. They view variable annuities. At, well, they are securities, but they view that as their securities portfolio and fixed annuities as their insurance portfolio. And, you know, when you look at them, their clients are about 80% in annuities, the various types, either fixed VA or indexed annuities. Obviously, wide, rate, wide um, range in age. Um, there's some who might question whether a 20-year-old should be in an annuity. There's also a lot who would question whether an 80 year old should be in an annuity other than of some fixed annuities. And Susan's been doing this for well over 20 years. One of the challenges for Susan is that it's very difficult for her to, to, um, to get new clients. And what she does to generate commissions is every few months after the end of the surrender period, she makes a recommendation to the clients to sell that position, sell that annuity and buy a new one. Obviously fixed is a little bit different. Um, they're gonna reach a maximum age and they're gonna have to be replaced. Otherwise their, you know, the return really drops off. But particularly for the variable annuities, this has been Susan's business. What really does um, inhibit her, creates more risk for her as an advisor is that she does this for multiple clients. So. She spent two, two weeks last year selling eight different clients the same annuity. And five years and a day later, or five years and a month later, she went to those same eight clients and sold them a different annuity. And when we start to look back at Susan's history, we see that's been a pattern, which really does, uh, does not bode well for her. She has an average of about 10% share of wallet. Um, and she's done no financial planning for her clients either. The 10% share of wallet, just like with John, is really challenging, particularly for those who only sell insurance. 
for any of you who are familiar, if you work in a bank affiliated broker dealer, um, the broker dealer is governed or has oversight by the bank for what's known as the RNDIP, the retail non-deposit investment products process. Um, and they look at brokers and what they're selling. And to those who are uninitiated, don't necessarily understand our business, seeing Susan's 10% share of wallet and all insurance to them, they view it as those clients are concentrated in insurance. And you have to jump over a lot of hurdles to get non-investment people to understand what's really happening is that Susan is really only going after that easy part of, of the book, just trying to get their insurance positions or sell them insurance for some open cash that they have. So again, no financial planning, Susan's just going with what she knows. So Phil, who's a financial advisor in Honest Abe's Wealth Management, um, he leads with planning. He doesn't sit down with a client and immediately recommend he, that they just buy something. He starts off building a relationship. Phil doesn't like sitting in front of his, you know, I'm going to age myself again, the Quotron, but his stock machine, his, uh, his stock readout. He doesn't want to sit there and look at positions all day. He wants to have a relationship with the client. He wants to go golfing with them. He wants to sit and you know eat a meal with them. Um, he wants to talk to them about what it is they want versus picking a stock, selling them an insurance policy, and then never talking to them again. So his clients have a really good mix. Individual equities, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, annuities, derivatives, managed money. Um, we, we like the fee-based stuff. And even lending products. So Honest Abe's Wealth Management is part of a bank and Phil is able to sell them a mortgage or at least introduce them to the mortgage department, have them get a mortgage, do some um, securities-based lending. Uh, obviously, they have margin accounts and other types of lending products. <clears throat> he's got about the same uh, range in age. He, he's been doing this about the same amount of time as the others. Maybe John was a little bit less. His turnover ratio is only about 40%, and that's really based on market fluctuation, and different changes in what the clients need. But yet notice his return is about 17%. Now, if you look at his ratio, his uh, commission ratio, 1.4%. Some of you might be saying, I like the 8% better that, uh, that John has. But that 1.4% keeps Phil off the radar from compliance from the regulators and allows him to grow his business through smart financial planning and making good recommendations. He has an average of 65% share of wallet, and he does financial planning for every single one of his clients, big and small. The smaller ones may not yield as much in the short term for him, but eventually they do. The 65% share of wallet is key. If you think about it, if we go back, trying to go back. Sorry, went back a little too far. If we go back to John, He's got 15% share of wallet. Phil has more than four times John's share of wallet. Now, if you remember what I said at the top of the discussion, it is no easier for John to get a client than it is for Phil. It's no easier for, uh, for Susan to get a client than, I'm sorry, it's no harder, no easier than it is for Phil. So getting these clients, getting these clients takes the same amount of time, whether you pick up 10% of their wealth 80% of their wealth or, or all of it, right? Perhaps you have to do a little more planning. Perhaps you spend a little more time um, putting orders in and introducing them to, you know, the manage, the folks who manage money, et cetera. But really it is not any more difficult to do that. So when you think about it, Phil's the smart one. Phil's going to spend less time in his compliance officer's office and less time responding to complaints and in depositions. So when we get to the compliance and regulatory discussion, so all these advisors get reviewed. None of them are exempt from review just because someone you know, has what could be viewed as a really good program does not mean that they're not examined. They get the branch inspections. Um, they're interviewed by the branch inspections team. FINRA often has inquiries on their business. Um, they've even been interviewed by FINRA and possibly even the SEC when they've come to do their examinations. However, John always questioned on his turnover and commission ratio. It's a pretty sweaty situation when you have to sit there and justify why 8% of your business or 8% of your client's book 
um, you know, generate is generating commissions. He's had a lot of complaints. Market's going up. That's great. Probably not going to yield too many complaints. The moment the market turns south, John now has numerous client complaints, and he's going to spend 7% of that 8% that he made in giving money back to clients and trying to settle complaints. He's been interviewed by FINRA multiple times. He's been the subject of many investigations. And, you know, his clients, you know, he loses clients when their stock picks are no good. So those clients are very easy to just pick up, sell out, take that cash and move it to another firm. Susan uh, is a little bit different because she does insurance while variable annuities are governed by FINRA. Um, she tends to hear more from the state departments of insurance and she's registered in many states across the country, sells insurance to customers in many states across the country. So she spends a lot of time with inquiries that flow through her compliance department. Um, she's always getting questioned on that concentration that we talked about. She's always trying to explain her methodology of taking a lower percentage of a customer's wallet um, in exchange for keeping the product selection simple. And she also doesn't get positive performance reviews because like I said, she spends a lot of time on a client to get that client to bring their assets over and then only sells them 10, 15, 20% of their wallet. When we get to Phil, generally doesn't appear in any exception reports. For those of you that have hit those exception reports and have inquiries, um, you know, it's not a fun place to be. Um, he's generally a regional leader in sales and client retention. He's had no complaints in the last 10 years. And he, that's about the amount of time he's been doing this methodology of leading with planning. He has a 95% client retention rate. And overall, his accounts are consistent. Uh, while he doesn't do a programmatic approach to those accounts, meaning he doesn't go out and buy 100,000 shares of IBM and split it amongst 100 accounts, um, he's not doing that. But his accounts are generally consistent based on their overall investment objectives. Not a lot of market gyration. If it is, if there is, he tends to move multiple clients in and out of positions as needed, but he spends more time meeting with his clients and less time sitting in front of his computer, staring at it, wondering what the market's going to do to his overall portfolio. And his average client retention is about 10 years. So those are the scenarios. I think the scenarios make it you know, fairly clear. Um, and like I said, these are actual scenarios that uh, I've experienced personally, not myself, but um, both in compliance and, and as a regulator. And I can tell you that it really does lead to the conclusion that financial planning is where it's at. It's what you want to do. It's in best interest to your clients. It's going to be great for your business. It's going to make your business somewhat easier as well, because it does allow you to get to know those clients, gather more of their assets, their family's assets, their friends' assets, rather than spend a lot of time picking stocks and, and just selling them mutual funds, uh, selling them insurance and doing 1035 exchanges. So that's the end of the presentation. With that, I want to see if we have any questions. Great. Uh, Professor Michaels, first of all, thank you. It was amazing. Uh, a lot of knowledge, a lot of, I love the scenarios, really good. I think everybody knows uh, Joe <laughs> or John, right? Yeah. Have seen some, some sort of, variation of uh, John and uh, the, the 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 lady I don't think I met one but Phil I've I've met Phil and uh, John so those I I know they, they exist but very interesting the second scenario too yeah. and um, so I have some questions here for you from sure. uh, people who are watching the first one uh, was, how much should I charge for my services as a financial advisor? So that's generally going to be set by your firm. Um, so when you think about it, especially with best interest, there was a lot of leveling of fees. Uh, I'll give you an example. It actually comes back to insurance. So various uh, insurance carriers pay, um, they pay different commission rates on their products. And the challenge in the past was an advisor or an insurance advisor, really, um, insurance agent, might sell one particular product over another from a different carrier just because they got a higher rate. We used to see it with proprietary mutual funds back in the early 2000s, where if you worked for a company that had their own mutual funds, they paid you 6% versus the third-party mutual funds that paid five. 
So what firms have done since then, they've leveled it. So you're going to be basically told what it is you're getting, uh, what you're going to charge for those, for those types of products. There's going to be a maximum. Of course, discounting always comes into effect, particularly for large size or volume. Um, and then when we get into the managed space, when we talk about fee-based accounts, really also going to be set by your firm. I know in firms where I've worked, we had a standard rate, let's say, and this is just you know an example, let's say it was one and a half percent. Um, and as an advisor, I had permission to drop it to 135 without any approvals. And if I went for certain approvals, I can get it as low as you know 110 basis points. So it really is set by your firm. You don't want to, here's what I can tell you that's important. You don't want to undercut your own importance, your own worth. So it's great to give discounts where it's necessary, but if you give discounts to everyone, what that's saying is your service is worth less because you're just discounting everyone. I see. Great. Yeah, I think. And I think uh, I, I'm not sure the the context of the the. I understood your your answer. I wonder if he was asking more in a in the in terms of a solo or independent advisor, not linked to a firm. Got it. How would he okay. set his price or something like that? Yeah, you know, that's difficult to say because, first of all, it, it's always changing. Um, mm -hmm. it, and it really depends on a couple of things. One is the size of the portfolio for each client. Um, another is what is your what is your um, opposition look like? You know, the people mm -hmm. that you're trying to, to take these clients away from, um, what does it look like for them? Goes back to what I said, though. If someone else is charging 150 basis points, do you really want to undercut your own income by saying, I'll charge you 100 basis points? Because again, you're discounting your own worth. You should really lead with what can you do for those clients? How is your service better? Not how are you cheaper? Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, the second question that we received here is how can a, how can an independent financial advisor compete against companies? You know, what it comes down to is relationships. And I think I know what you're talking about. So if you, and I'll throw just out some firm names, you know, if you're an independent with LPL or Satera or maybe the Wells Fargo, um, the Wells Fargo independent channel, I forget the name all of a sudden. Um, yeah. You have your own shingle hanging up, maybe a, you know, you've seen this all the times, Edward Jones, places like that. You know, you rent an old house, you set up an office and you do it. Yeah, you have to really lead with relationship, which includes planning. But now you really are, are the only way you're going to compete because your prices aren't going to be able to be much less because obviously you have to pay for a lot of things yourself. Um, you've got to build that relationship. Look at your competition. Your competition are large firms generally. And at those firms, you know, it, it's a rotation. It's somebody, somebody's a broker, they leave, they take 60% of their clients with them, 40% remain behind, they get pushed to the next couple of brokers. So if there's no relationships there, they're not able to keep them. You've got to build those relationships. That's how you keep them. Okay. Okay. Uh, the third question we got was, what is the best path to beginning a career in financial advising? Uh, should I go through banks, small firms, or as an independent? So I would, and this is my opinion, this is not, you know, not gospel. Um, I would stay away from independent starting out because independent, you're really responsible for managing the entire business. And when I say that, I mean your office space, your telephone, your computer, everything. So if you're not making enough, you're not going to be able to pay the bills, not only your own bills, but the bills for the company because it's your company. Um, if you want to go someplace that has a good training program, what really tends to work best is if you can link up with a more senior advisor and become a junior advisor to that senior advisor or team. That's where you're really going to learn the business. I've seen, you know, I've worked at a few different firms where we recruited, uh, we recruited in teams and teams didn't get to be really big until about, call it 20 years ago or so. And you would, I would see the same thing with every successful team. Two really senior folks, men or women. Um, one's really good on the equity side. One's good on the fixed income side. And then a junior person learning the business, doing pretty well for themselves and handling some of the day-to-day. -day. So not a sales assistant, 
really, um, an actual financial advisor, fully licensed, and and you know they're interacting with those clients, and eventually they become a full member of the team. Uh, that's a good way. It's not always possible to do that. In which case, you got to revert back to go to the firm that offers a really good training program. Mm -hmm. If you put your name out there to become a financial advisor and try and um, get interviews with different firms, the larger firms, you should push on them, question them. What's the training you're going to get? How are you not going to be left out in the cold? How are you going to make sure? How are they going to guarantee your success? Because them guaranteeing your success is going to make them successful. Okay. Yeah, that that's that sounds very uh a very nice path i think it's safe because the, the independent it's you, you're a business pretty much right it has you all the challenges of owning a business right yeah. on top of build, their career <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> okay um another question that we got was how can someone who is already cfp stand out against other cfps hmm It's kind of, I'm trying to think uh, the way I'm seeing, thinking about it is kind of general. I'm not sure I can, I'm not sure I can even answer that stand out against other CFPs. I guess if you're, it depends if you're working on your own, if you're on your own or if you're with in a company, you know, I'm not sure. I wouldn't mind if that person wants to somehow follow up. Let me uh, see here. I can get or get more information. So he's independent. He's independent. So that's going to be similar to my answer before. Um, the one before about relationships, probably, yeah, right? It all comes back to relationships. You can't win on price because you undercut your own own importance, your own level of worth. Um, you're really gonna you're gonna go after that that relationship, and you that's where you need talk about share of wallet. You want to get the whole share of wallet. You want as much of it as you can get. Um, you know, being smart, doing well, all that's great. It's a good opener, but then. You need to be a, a you know, I hate to say it this way, you need to be a friend to that client so that they trust you enough to give you all of their wealth and let you manage it. I see. I see. And uh, let me just. Uh... And I'll just I'll just add this before you ask the next question. You know, for those of you that have seen clients, uh, so particularly in the bank affiliated broker dealers where the bank brokerage firm owns the clients, not the advisor. You know, how many times have you seen this where the advisor leaves and the client finds out 18 months later, I never heard from my advisor in 18 months, only to find out that two other advisors have gone through the rotation since then. There's no uh -huh. relationship there. Those clients really can, will get lost. But if you're, particularly if you're solo practice or a small group, um, you could really win over those clients. And you'd be surprised. There are particularly the bank affiliated clients the reason they're there, they have a lot of money and they have money in the bank, literally millions in the bank. And some of them are scared to invest it. So you can get it. I see. And uh, now I, I have a question, a curiosity, actually. Sure. Uh, at the time you were talking about the risk uh, management and the, the risk tolerance of clients. <laughs> and um, I wonder how an advisor deals with a client because when everybody wins, everybody's happy, but the problem is when people lose money and then when people lose money, they get really upset. So even low risk operations, they carry a risk, even if it's low. And eventually I assume some people lose money in the low risk operations. How do you deal with the customer that I just thinking as a lot of people that I know, they would say, okay, you said it was low risk and I assumed it was no risk, which is not true, but I see this type of complaining coming to an advisor saying, okay, I lost, you You. You. you recommended this uh, very low risk portfolio. I still lost money. You didn't do a good job pretty much. I, I wonder if this happens and how, how you guys deal with this. Yeah, so uh, I'll say this. One is it's impossible to de-risk anything completely. I'll mm -hmm. give you a scenario that's, I can tell you is a real scenario, um, but you know we won't mention any names, but let's say you sell your client a fixed annuity and you know it's an insurance company. I mean, it's safe, right? It's an annuity. It's going to give you, you know, maybe a few years ago, you were getting 3%, 2.5%. It was guaranteed for five years, seven years, whatever it was. 
you put, you know, your, your little grandma went into it and your grandpa, and they were really happy. They were getting that return. The money was safe. Couldn't be any safer. Felt as safe as being in a government bond. And then suddenly that insurance company goes out of business. And now you're stuck with various things that could happen. One is an insurance company in particular doesn't go out of business overnight. So now your money's locked up for multiple years when you thought you were going to be able to have that income in two years. Now you don't. And that's the unfortunate part of this business. And that's the thing where having the backing of your firm is important, but more importantly, how you operate as an advisor. Not that we want to scare our clients, but did we give them the right disclosures? Not only disclosures to protect ourselves. Yeah, we have to do that. I mean, disclosures so that they can make sound judgment. Hey, look, it's an insurance company. Uh, it's in Pennsylvania. And look, any business could go out of business. If it goes out of business, however, uh, Pennsylvania has a guarantee fund that'll give you back at least $250,000. Great. Maybe I only want to invest $250,000 in that insurance company. Okay, that's a fair assumption. So maybe you don't lead with that, but you do need to disclose these things to clients to be fair. Again, the disclosures are required, but the ones that are more of you being fair and honest with the client, that's the one where when something happens, the client's not going to turn to you and say, in most cases, won't turn to you and say, you never told me, I didn't understand, um, you duped me, you made X percent on this, and now I'm out my money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you got to be honest with clients. Yeah, that's, that's, and I that's see great. That. Yeah. I see that sometimes I see it in complaints and I literally see the email traffic between the client and the advisor and the advisor makes it appear like there's absolutely no risk. Doesn't flat out say it. Makes it I don't know why you would do that. Not again, you're not supposed to scare the client, but make them understand the realities. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. People are pretty, pretty forgiving and pretty, pretty understanding as long as you're honest with them. Not everyone, but most. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Great to know. Okay, so I think those were our questions. Every, at least that's, that's all I got here. And uh, so I would just like to thank you again, Michael. It was a pleasure. It was a lot of knowledge. I really liked the presentation. Thank you. And uh, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. And uh, that was great. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.